We are live on day 296, and our guest today is Matthew Bird. Matthew, welcome. Thank you, Eric. Thanks for having me. Good to see you again. Uh, you are one of the premier watercolorists. What are you going to do for us today? Uh, today, I'm going to be doing a uh, study of a pomegranate and doing some wet into wet washes to build up uh, form and color. And uh, hopefully, it'll be a, a fun little, fun little demo. Now, you're you're a um, uh, how how could I, how would you describe yourself? I I would say you're very tight watercolorist. You know, oftentimes we see watercolor where the you know you've got the bleed going on and a lot and the blossoms and so on. And sure. it looks like you've got very strong control over your watercolors. Yes, uh, I'm often confused with an oil painter. People think they're like, that's watercolor? Yes, it's watercolor. Um, it's just because I get a lot of little darks and um, lots of detail and control, as you said. So so yeah, what's I'm that just... behind you there? Uh, that it looks like, is that one of your watercolors behind you there in that frame? Yeah. So that's a watercolor that um, I just varnished yesterday, actually. So I can display it without glass. Um, and Oh, we're... That's that's exciting. That's what I'll be uh, not that painting, a different painting, but I'll be talking about that for watercolor live. Oh, and how to how to varnish paintings and 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 so yep. you don't have to. Oh, that'll that'll be exciting. Good. So why don't we get right into your demo? And I, what I'll do is I'll um, I'll answer questions uh, from the comments, and I'll mention where people are coming in from. There's Hazel from New Zealand, for instance, and also I should just mention to you guys that um, uh, we have. Uh, prize today, uh, the winner of the plein air apron is Vanya Vieros from Massachusetts. I'm sorry, I probably butchered your name, Vanya. Uh, and uh, today I'm giving away my book, Make More Money Selling Your Art. Uh, that will be for comments. And so go into the comments, tell us where you're from, and then we will pick not only from the live, but also from the replay, and you'll get a chance to win. Matthew, let's get right into it. All right, let's do it. All right, so this is where I've, I've got uh, my background started already. So um, this is all dry. You don't have to hear me blowing a hair dryer, and I can just get into the good stuff here. Um, Do you want to just give us a brief overview of what you did with your background? Yep. Um, so I have masked out my fruit here uh, with masking fluid, which is a – product that you can paint on it's it's like a liquid masking tape almost um it's like a resist so it preserves the white of the paper um, right. i don't i'm sure we have all different skill levels watching so i don't want to bore people too much but um with traditional transparent watercolor i don't have a white paint so any whites that i have it's the paper showing through my transparent washes so preserving those whites are really important so I masked out the fruit and did my, my background uh, wet into wet. I like a real dark background a lot of times in my still life. It's really a, a Dutch Flemish inspired, um, you know, traditional still life. And traditionally watercolorists will work um, light to dark. So I'm, it's a little unusual to, to go so dark right in the beginning, but just the way my mind works, I I like the, to have those dark values in place so I can play the color against it and make sure I'm getting the right value and color when I go in the in for my detail work. And I work wet into wet. So I, I've got blue um, over here behind these pomegranates. And let me bring up my reference photo just so you can see what we're going to be looking at. So I it really accentuated the blue because I just want that that contrast with the red. I think that'll make a nice um, yeah. nice composition. Um, the other thing, so after I, I did the background, I, I pulled the mask up and exposed the, the paper. Um, one of the things that I wanted to, to point out that's a little different from what um, you might have seen before is I'm working on a, paper that is on an ACM panel. So it's two sheets of aluminum. Very light, very thin. What kind it's what is that a is that something you pick up in the stores? What's it called? Yep, Raymar makes this. It's um, okay. 
it's traditional Fabriano watercolor paper um, on aluminum composite material. Oh, that's very, that's a new thing and it's pretty cool. It is a new thing. I helped them develop it and I really like working on it because the, the paper doesn't warp or buckle. You know, traditionally you have to stretch watercolor paper and then either staple it or tape it down. And this just kind of cuts out that step. Yeah, well, you could also and, put it in a frame much easier too. Exactly. Yep. I varnish them and then pop them right into a frame and don't have to worry about cool. um, glass and cutting a mat and such. So I'm going to put out some uh, some color here. Normally my palette looks like this, just a, a mess of grays, but I cleaned up this side so that... That was very nice of you. <laughs> I will be a pro professional. Try to be a professional artist. All right. So I'm playing around with some dis different uh, cadmiums here and uh, pyrrole. And my brush here is a synthetic squirrel hair. This is made by Skoda. It's uh, just a small mop that really holds uh, a lot of water. And I'm going to start, start doing this one. And so just to point out, after I removed my mask here, I have gone in, and this is what the bottle of the mask that I'm using is from Daniel Smith. I have masked again this highlight. And down here, you can see I had mask where I was working on the table in the shadow. So, so that's know. a color. That's a colored mask. It's got a slight bit it's of color a to slight, it. Slight, a slight color to it. Um, there's other brands like PBO that have a bluish tint, which are. It's a great. It's a great masking fluid as well. Um, we learned so, the other day you can add your own tint to it as well. Yes, I've heard of that and. Um, get the right color that can be really good it's always you got to test it of course because you don't want to stain the paper yeah uh, so clean water i'm just gonna go in so you're laying water down first yep is it thick or thin uh it's pretty pretty washy i'm, I'm getting it pretty wet um, okay. And what kind I'm of, not, uh, what kind of Fabriano paper is it? Is it cold pressed or? Oh, uh, good I question. Know. I work on a uh, cold press usually. Cold pressed. Okay. Hello, Tunisia. Welcome. Now I did not go all the way up to the edge because since I do have this dark here, I want to be real careful about not reactivating that. So that takes some. Can you put uh, a resist or uh, over something that's already painted? So if you wanted to keep it preserved, or would that pull up the paint? You can. It's a little trickier, but it, it definitely can be done. It has a lot to do with how thick the, the paint is. Like, I wouldn't want to do that here, but I could do yeah. it down here probably, no problem. Okay. Hello, Dubai. Welcome. All right. So right now I'm mixing up a uh, carmine, which is a PR176 pigment, which I think will be a nice dark on this shadowy side. You said um, it's a PR176. Nobody knows what that means. What does that mean? That's a secret code, Eric. Ah. Uh, no, it's not. It's uh, each pigment has its own number. So when you have, you know, different manufacturers make their, their paints differently. Uh, but you can all, on all of them, you can look on the side and it'll tell you exactly what the pigment is that is, whether it's a single pigment paint or multiple pigments combined to kind of shortcut to get to a color. Do you, do you have a preference? I am, I know there's purists that, that only use, um, you know, single pigment. I, most of my palette is is single pigment, but uh, I'm not opposed to shortcut colors. All right. So this is PR176. This is Carmine. Yep. This is a Daniel Smith pigment.
Wow, you you have a steady hand. Yeah, you want to be careful, like I said, but um, you know, it just comes with practice. Now I'm going to drop in a little bit different value here. Still pretty intense. Hard to tell. This is probably going to get much darker, so I'm going to be I'm going to be glazing over this to 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 bring this to a much darker value on the shadow side. Somebody asked what kind of varnish you use. Um, I use golden, golden products, um, spray archival gloss to to seal the paint onto the surface, and then uh, there's various um, varnishes you can put on top of that to get a different sheen if you like. So you can um, use a traditional varnish once you've sealed it. Correct. Whether All it's right. acrylic based or mineral spirit based, either way, and then you can, you know, it's all subjective as far as what sort of uh, if you want a satin look or a high gloss or a matte. You just kind of have to play around with it and see what you like. All right. So I'm adding in some CAD light to warm this up on this side. I think I got a little couple flux here dark that I don't want so I'm gonna scrub that a little bit get a stiffer synthetic brush and work this a little bit so I don't, I don't want that there a lot of the paper towel yeah hello Ireland Uh, somebody said there's a YouTube video of varnishing on your website. There is, yes. And I will be, if you're just joining us, I'll be doing a more elaborate talk and demonstration on my process at Watercolor Live. I put your website up. It's matthewbird.com. So you're going to do an extensive still life and uh, varnishing and, and whole nine yards on watercolor live. Cool. Yes. Yeah, so I varnish a full sheet painting 30 by 22. So one of my, one of the big ones. Now you are uh, an officer with one of the watercolor associations. Do you want to tell us about that? Uh, National watercolor society in California. Um, they are uh, currently getting ready to do our member show. So the entries are open for that on the website. It's a great organization and a great way to network. And Yeah. Well, and you and I met. We're, to, we're, we're, to the, uh, the online environment these days. So, yeah. But well, we had a meeting. I'm trying to remember where it was. Was it in San Francisco or was it yes, the year before? It was, yeah. San Francisco. Okay. So we we talked about this vision for creating a you know a watercolor conference and and uh, you were very supportive and encouraging and and now involved. So I, I want to thank you. Uh, this wouldn't have happened without you. Oh well, I, it's it's a passion of mine and, and I. There's so many people out there that are working in watercolor. Um, kind of anything I can do to contribute to that and, and raise the medium, raise, raise awareness. You know, I, I don't know if you know this yet, but so far, Watercolor Live is the largest uh, online virtual conference we've done. It has exceeded all of our others. I think we're, I haven't seen today's numbers, but we're almost at 1,600 people. Yeah, that, that doesn't surprise me at all. I mean, domestically or internationally, it's it's a huge. Yeah, we have people from all um, over the world, all yeah. over the world signed up. Really big in in, in Asia and India. Yeah, I some great watercolors there. <laughs> Somebody from India was taking my workshop, and she was 
happened to get up at like 5 a.m. God bless her. Yeah. Well, we have people watching this right now in places like uh, Egypt and Saudi Arabia. It's in the middle, you know, very, very different time zones. Um, so it's really terrific. One of the great things of the internet, bringing us all together. You guys, make sure you tell us where you're watching from. Uh, in the comments, you have a chance to win my book, Make More Money Selling Your Art. Hey, Belize. Welcome, Belize. I think one thing nice, uh, hello, Pakistan. Uh, one thing nice about this conference, Watercolor Live, is that you can you can find a lot of different approaches and styles um, in watercolor. I, I, before I created this, I didn't realize how many different approaches there were. Yeah, it's really, it's really exploded. Um, the uh, kind of traditional idea of what watercolor should look like, quote unquote, um, it's kind of been blown to smithereens. So many people are working and doing just incredible things with, with the water media. Yep. Hey, Norway, Scotland, Hawaii. Thank you. Great Britain. So just to go back to the, um, the masking that I was talking about, which you can still see this highlight is preserved. That, that white of the paper is so important with transparent because we don't have white paint. And one of the ways that I've, I've tried to describe watercolor to people that aren't quite familiar with how it works is using a sculpture analogy because it's really a subtractive medium where we're, we're removing the white and and adding dark you can't go back relatively speaking you can't go back to that white once it's gone so it's it's like sculpting in marble you know, if you're if you're sculpting a bust and you uh chisel off too much of the nose it's not really going back on <laughs> yeah yeah that's right whereas with oil or acrylic if that, that's more like sculpting with clay you can add it's additive you have opaque and white paint, so if you and you can just wipe out and keep going. So it's a little more forgiving, perhaps. So what you're doing right now is a build-up, layer over layer. Is that correct? C correct. I haven't really let this dry, so it's it's uh, not exactly glazing wet over dry, but I am definitely building up and uh, really keeping in mind the the warm side of this pomegranate and how it, it's going to come around and get cooler. And one of the, one of the things I tell my students is knowing when to, to hold up and, and let it, let it dry because it can be easy to overwork your paper, overwork the surface and too much water. Just, yeah, well, it starts to, the paper fiber can start to, you know, just get tired and like, you gotta let it dry and before you, you muddy things up too much. All right. And that comes hello, with experience. Hello, Germany, Philippines, Nova Scotia. Man, you're drawing them in, Matthew. Well, that's wonderful. Welcome, Sudan. everyone. Welcome, Sudan. That's the first for Sudan that I've seen. UK, Peter in UK. What what color will you use to create the dark? Asks Anita. Um, maybe you saw just there, I was kind of just pulling from some of the gray slop I have on my palette. But um, ultramarine, French ultramarine will probably be a great, uh, great help to push that, that dark where I want it to be. So let's let's do that now. Somebody who tuned in late asked, uh, "How did you prevent from bleeding into the background?" And what was your answer on that? You oh, used like a right here? yeah. So everything was preserved with masking fluid, 
when I did a wet into wet background wash. And the and background is dry. So once the background is dry, what I'm doing coming in here is just, you know, careful brush work and control to, to not reactivate it. You can go up to the edge. I mean, I'm not going to go and like just scrub at it because that would, that would reactivate the pigment and it would, it would start to, to blend, which I do sometimes. It can be nice. Somebody asked, how do you keep it wet all this time? Um, constant vigilance. I just keep, <laughs> I'm just moving around to different spots. So over here, it's starting to dry. So I think I will uh, bring this dark around. Somebody asked, does the paper need to stay wet as you glaze? Working wet into wet, it does, yes. So if you look, look here, this paper is still damp. So the edge that I'm just putting down here is not super crisp and flat. It's, it's got a little bit of a bleed to it. Whereas over here, it bled a lot more because the paper was much more wet. And it comes with uh, practice and just knowing, you know, how wet the paper surface is to know what, what the paint's going to do when you put it down. I'm going to stop on that one and let that dry a little bit. All right. This is a clean brush. I'm just smoothing it out a little bit. But once I do more layers, it'll all come together more and more. In case you missed it, uh, Matthew is painting on a uh, Raymar panel with Fabriano cold press paper attached to it. It's an aluminum panel. Yeah, it's real thin, very lightweight. So again, on this pomegranate, I have masking fluid down here and here on this little seed that came out or the fruit. So. That was there when I was just painting the, the tabletop. And now I'm gonna pull it off with, you can use a rubber cement pickup or just your finger really, but it comes up pretty easy. What brand of color are you using? Uh, most of my palette is Daniel Smith. I also use uh, Sennelier and Core. Daniel Smith paints are traditional. Uh, the gum Arabic has the pigment binder, which is the traditional binder. Uh, Sennelier uses honey. That way you can eat your paint, right? <laughs> Spread it on your toast. Just don't eat the cads. Don't eat the cads, that's right. The honey paint doesn't dry on in your paint wells the same way gum arabic does so it reactivates very very quickly with a touch of a brush which which deactivates quickly the honey or the gum arabic honey based okay so sennelier uh, m Graham also makes honey based watercolor and a little goes a long way uh, judy asked what you use to mount the paper on the substrate it came mounted Right, this, this came already done, so it just saves me that step. If I, and I talk about this at Watercolor Live, but the, if I paint just on watercolor paper and I finish the painting and then mount it, um, there's a way to do that too. I use a soft gel gloss as an archival way to, to do that. If you guys are planning on coming to Watercolor Live and you haven't signed up yet, you could save 300 bucks if you sign up by the 20th, which I think is, what is that, Sunday? Mm, no, 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 it's the, uh, it's Wednesday. It's Inauguration Day. My dad's birthday. Oh. He'll be 94. Hello, Austria. 
Uh, Austria asks, do you also use opaque colors? No. There are some, um, some pigments that are sort of semi, semi opaque, but I use no, no opaque. It's, it's a transparent medium. You could, I mean, you could combine watercolor and gouache. Um, lots of people do that. Do you ever do any plein air painting? I do, especially when I'm at pace, but I'm not really known for that. And, uh, so uh, was San Francisco your first experience going to pace? It was, yes. So tell, tell people what that was like, because a lot of people don't even know about it. I don't talk about it very much. Yeah, it was pretty incredible. I mean, you guys put on quite a quite an operation. I was very impressed. Um, the number of people all being there. I I just I think one of the things I love the most is the camaraderie, uh, getting together with other artists. You know, no matter what you paint or how you paint, it's just a lot of fun to. Be well, all so for those. And uh, yeah. the number of, of, of the, the incredible talent that is, you know, on the stage and, and teaching is, you can't really, um, I don't know of another place where you can find that kind of thing all in one place for three days or whatever it was. I think four days. So the plein air convention has stages typically for watercolor, pastel, um, oil and uh, of, oftentimes we blend them into other other mediums as well gouache and acrylic and so on and then uh, we do indoor training uh, it's like four days we go out half days or quarter days and go painting together which is a lot of fun too to to walk we were all standing out at the golden gate bridge there probably were close to a thousand of us painting it was really quite an experience yeah You have a lot of patience, my friend. Yes. It takes, uh, it takes patience to do this kind of painting. It does. I'm, I'm, I'm a very slow painter. That's all right. But, uh, you don't seem yeah. that slow to me. I'm, I'm trying to keep this interesting. <laughs> but what I'm doing now is... Um, same thing on this side. I, I just I wet with clear, clean water, and uh, now I'm just dropping in color. So that's pretty important to make sure you keep your water clean. Yes. Yes, I I have I don't know. It's probably a gallon of water in two different containers. So one I keep clean, and the other is my my rinsing. Somebody told us the other day they use distilled water because it won't develop mold long term. Well, I know I'm a slow painter, but I'm not that slow. I don't think I mean I don't think we mean mold while you're painting. <laughs> <laughs> um, that's that's interesting. I haven't heard that before. I use just tap water. Hello from Pune, India. Somebody asks, somebody says, I hope the plein air convention continues this year. I was looking forward to participating last year, and I would love to meet so many folks in this community who we've met virtually, plus an awesome week away from reality with like-minded, passionate folks learning and creating. Well, we hope so too, uh, Jeff. The uh, uh, We just don't know. I mean, we're planning on having it, but uh, we're going to have to kind of wait and see what happens with this virus. It's not till May. Uh, the the early bird price expires on Valentine's Day, so you save five hundred bucks. You get in before that, and of course, we refund your money if you you uh, can't make it. This, how long will this session last? We're going to be on till the top of the hour, till five minutes till the top of the hour. Another thirty minutes, twenty five minutes. I'll share a, a photo of this, you know, when I finish it. I definitely can't do it in an hour. Sorry. 
I often go back and forth, jump around a painting while I'm waiting for one area dry. I'll, I'll jump over to something else. Diane says that the um, Margaret Best, the botanical painter, uses distilled water in Canada. That's because they have more mold in Canada. <laughs> <laughs> Just kidding. Don't write letters. <laughs> now you've done it. It's, it's very easy to offend people. I don't mean to, ever. I just see. Can some, you uh, specify exactly where we can see the finished piece afterwards? Uh, Bertram, it will be, Matthew will post it. Uh, if you go back to the replay of this later today, when he finishes it, uh, or whenever he's done with it today, tonight, whatever, he'll post it in here. And because you made comments in here, if he posts it, it'll come up to you um as you know a comment so you'll you'll be able to see it so i'm also looking at this and keeping in mind that um there is going to be um, reflected light from the table that bounces up onto the underside here likewise this top little corner here is going to get some reflection from this pomegranate. So this, this little area is going to get real hot. So even in the early stages, I'm thinking about that. And okay. so this is a, just a clean brush, it's slightly damp, and I'm going to lift. You're lifting. I'm lifting some paint out. Okay. Welcome to somebody else from India. A lot of people from UK today. <clears throat> if you uh, if you are an Instagrammer, Matthew, what's your Instagram handle? It's Matthew Bird with underscores the beginning and end. So, underscore Matthew Bird. Yep. Underscore. Okay. All right. Mine is just Eric Rhodes, R H O A D S, no E. So here you see I've got the foundation laid in here where I've got a real high chroma reflection coming off this pomegranate. And down here, I added in a little bit of cerulean blue to, uh, to get that light that's bouncing up off the table on the underside. Okay. And I'll just continue to build that up as I work these layers up. And this one's getting to the point where I need to stop messing with it and let it dry. Which means I can go over here. I use the back of my hand to, to tell how dry it is. You really want it bone dry. And for some reason, the back, I can just, it's, the paper is very cool. If it's at all damp, I can feel coolness and I know that it's not quite ready. More cad, cad yellow light. And that may, that's medium actually. Sorry. So this is wet on dry now. So I can get a little bit of the texture. Having my brush kind of jump and skip around on the surface, leaving you know, gaps and spaces. And you're painting right over the masking fluid, right? Correct. So this paint is not super wet. It's a bit of a, a dry brush technique to help with that texture a little bit. You see it skipping around. So you've got no water on that brush? 
it's very, very minor. Very yeah. Just, just slightly damp. This is fun. I like seeing this. I am so excited about learning watercolor. It's a great medium. I love the luminosity. Um, and you know, I, the other thing that I really like is I can kind of jump in and out of it pretty quick without a lot of cleanup or setup. I got young kids, so it's always, it's a luxury to have hours and hours all at once to be able to paint. So being <laughs> able to just yeah, I remember those days. Get 20 no. minutes here or there is nice. No solvents. What age are your kids? They are seven and nine. Oh, what what a great time. Yeah. Also that's, great right there, that's before <laughs> they start talking back. <laughs> oh, boy. <laughs> Everybody always told me, uh, you know, it's going to happen. It goes by very fast, and I never believed it. And then my kids graduated high school and went off to college, and it seemed like a blink of an eye. Yeah, I remember meeting your, your youngest, I think, in San Francisco. Yes, you met one, one of, of my sons. Yeah. yeah. I think uh, two of my kids, maybe three of them, are going to come with me to the plein air convention this year because they get out of school early. Ah. And they were two of them were jealous their one brother got to go. So we'll see. They'll criticize me, though. They'll say, Dad, don't make those corny jokes on stage. <laughs> you tell them that's part of your brand? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, bad jokes. Bad <laughs> jokes are my brand. So I just grabbed some uh, neutral tint there to just kind of shortcut this, this dark so I can get keep this moving. Ooh. You just got to keep layering and layering to get those darks to get darker, don't you? That's, yeah, that's how I tend to do it. Um, I think the real pros can just come in and hit, it, hit the right color every time, but I like oh, to build I, it. <laughs> I think you're a real pro. Takes a little longer, but um, in the end, you know, the it's transparent watercolor, so all those layers are are working together to create that that beautiful luminosity. Now, over here on this side, it's going to be the same thing as far as the reflected light bouncing up. It's just not not as obvious. Yeah, you really have to learn to see that, though. I, when, when I first started painting, people talked about reflected light, and I couldn't see it. You know, sometimes it's very subtle. Yep. Now I'm looking at my, my reference, and I'm seeing that this value shift happens really abruptly. It goes from really dark to kind of a mid-value high chroma, red-orange there. So I want to try to capture that and not have it be too gradual because that'll aid in um, sort of conveying the, the different flat, round, bumpy sides of this pomegranate. You know, it's not a perfect sphere. It's got right. It's got some character, so. Somebody said, when you post your images, would you please post some close-ups as well? Oh, absolutely. Okay, so Melissa says, tell us more about the use of masking fluid. I've never had success with it. What's the key? Oh, boy. I, Practice. I've got quite the the spiel I go through in my workshops because it it can be a real struggle. So I, I understand uh, most of what you're what you're saying. There's 
there's kind of two different kinds. You have a masking fluid that's basically white, dries white. And then you have some that's tinted, and we mentioned that earlier, or you can tint it yourself. Um, the nice thing about the tint is you can see where you've, you've applied it, but some brands tend to leave a, a faint stain on the paper, which I don't particularly like. So if you're using the white masking fluid, the, you run the risk of not really seeing everything and you think you have everything masked, but you might've missed a spot and you just can't really tell because it's, it's white and yeah. not just the paper. So kind of pick your trade off. Um, you need to make sure your mask is fresh. It definitely ages. And if, if, if you're working with older fluid, it's not going to come off the paper real well. Okay. You want to make sure you don't heat up your, if it's dried on there, you don't really want to use a, a hot hair dryer or, or bake it in the sun or anything, because then it'll be hard to get off the paper. Somebody asked if your if your reference for weeks and weeks either. Yeah. That's Somebody asked if your reference is a photo or are you is it a live reference? This one's a photo. Okay. Although this would be the kind of thing I could do live. Somebody asked if this is oil painting. No, this is watercolor. If you just tuned in. Hard to believe it's Friday already, man. This week went by. Sure did. I don't know about you, Eric, but my days just seem to feel the same <laughs> over and over. Yeah, it's ground, it's been, we don't get out, you know, we're not doing a whole lot these days. It's called like Groundhog Day, right? Yeah. It's a lot like I hear the trash coming, I'm like, oh, it's Wednesday. Shoot. We get the trash out. Now, wait a minute. You're a world famous artist. You have to take out your own trash. Don't you have people who do oh, that for you? Yeah, yeah. Okay, it froze up for the second there. I was a little concerned. <clears throat> oh, I hope that's not on my end. You're working all right now? Yep, everything's fine now. Uh, guys, uh, day 300 is coming up. Uh, well, this is 296. You can figure it out. If you have a special idea of what you want me to do on day 300, I'm still trying to figure it out. Put it in the comments. Um we could do something special on day 300 and I've put together a ton of really great prize packages for day 300 today. You can win, uh, by putting something in the comments, you have a chance of winning the, uh, make more money selling your art book. It's a, a two times Amazon bestseller and, uh, really will help you with selling your art. If you're trying to figure that out. Are you left-handed or is the video reversing? No, I am left-handed. So I just threw in some little blotches here. Just some texture. Those will be the blemishes, yep. There's another person, Iris, tuning in from Deutschland. Erstangschlich Kernen. So Kernen is Cologne, I believe. Maybe Kern. I'm a little rusty on my German. Been there 40 times. Wow. I was married to a German woman for a long, long time. I would explain it. Would I have Nietzsche's use there? <clears throat> Somebody wants me to do a demo. No, 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 Gabriel. I don't do I'm not gonna do that. Thank you for asking though. You can go to my paintbynote.com if you want to see a demo. 
I've seen you paint. You could you could do a demo. Ah, uh, yeah, but uh, I want to make this show about everybody else, not about me. So well, that's drying. I'm gonna <laughs> jump up here and do a little bit in this. Uh, gosh, I don't know what you call it. The stem. Uh, Kernan means skill. I thought it was like. Kern like cologne. So thank you, Iris, for that. Somebody said, where do you buy your left-handed brushes? <laughs> <laughs> Especially made by Escoda. Yeah. I should mention to you guys, hang around uh, when we before we finish because I have uh, an announcement, <clears throat> something we announced yesterday by email in case you missed it pretty big. And also uh, tell you how you can win a $7,000 painting. So that's pretty cool. Matthew, you're just blowing this away. This is fabulous. You're very kind. I'd I would say, say I, little, I didn't mean it. I was a little nervous about doing this because I'm not, I don't get a whole lot done in an hour or 45 minutes or whatever done. So. Hopefully it's well, interesting. We don't, nobody expects it. Nobody expects it. So Beverly asked you about varnishing watercolor. Uh, you're going to do that on your watercolor live demo on, on watercolor live. Yep. So uh, that's going to be pretty cool. I think that I think that's a game changer. You know, Raymar putting these panels, uh, these papers on panels, so it gives you a stiff surface to work outdoors or to frame, and then uh, learning how to varnish it. You know, that's one of the big problems I hear about from watercolorists who want to go to plein air shows is they don't want to carry all the glass with them and right. the, and the mats and so on. And this is a, a great way. I'll just show you guys real quickly. Well, um, well, I can. Uh, here is. Well, I don't have it framed, but I'll show you a couple of pieces of Matthew's work. And uh, but if you look, Matthew, can you put the other camera on real quickly so we can just see yep, uh, the one, behind, one behind you? Yeah. So that there's no glass in that, and that that's fabulous, and it really glows. All right, terrific. Okay, get back to yeah. work. I'm a slave driver. <laughs> I got started getting into that because I I really didn't like the glare of glass and uh, it's a little unconventional. Some of the peers don't really agree with it. Well, I, I would, I remember going to the Planner painters of America show in Tahoe about, I don't know, probably 13, 14 years ago. And uh, I think it was Mary Deloitte aren't who had uh, a watercolor with no, it was just framed. It was just varnished. And I, it just was so pleasing to see that. And um, it, it really made a big difference. And she said, you know, they sell much better for her in these shows uh, because sometimes people are traveling, they're, they're a little concerned about carrying glass home. And uh, plus you get to see the, you know, the richness of the color without the glare. Yes. And <laughs> Those, I don't, I don't know why, but galleries that I've talked to tend to prefer, you know, no glass. Yeah. Um, well, I think this is going to really this this trend is really helping the watercolor world. I mean, there's nothing wrong with framing under glass. I don't want to send that signal at all. No, and I still frame, you know, a lot of my work traditionally as well. I, um, but there are there are some dealer biases that occur, and um, so that'll help for some dealers help overcome those biases. My, so we got about five minutes, Matthew. So oh, okay. I know you don't have much time. Well, let me let me see if I can take off that mask just so you can see what uh, I get the magic. Yeah. It's a little, little premature, but why not? You gotta live a little. You gotta, you gotta live boldly. Let's see. There it is. 
Now you're using a, a like a rubber cement eraser. Yep. You know, actually, the best thing to lift up mask is the mask itself. If you have like an old ball of it, it takes to itself really well. So oh, really? there, there's the uh, the gleaming white of the paper. Now, it's a telltale sign you've used masks because you know those edges are so incredibly crisp. And um, what I will do is come back with a a stiff synthetic and slightly damp and just kind of give it a a little zhuzh. Just to soften that edge a little bit. Soften the edge a little bit, yeah, make it look a little more natural. You know, the other thing, uh, Matthew, somebody was talking about, you know, the, the glass preserving, keeping the paint from fading. But my understanding in talking to the manufacturers is that they've pretty much overcome that problem that fading is something that occurred way back, but less so today than ever. Is that correct? Yeah, that's correct. I mean, there's a there's a few a few things. I mean, the pigments are, you know, amazing. The same pigments for oil. It's just the binder's different. So the old days, the pigment was inferior, and that was definitely an issue. But that's not the case any longer. I mean, watercolor is a more... Um, let me say, delicate medium. So you, just by the nature of the binder and the way that it sits on the surface of the paper. Um, but with with proper varnishing, you get UV protection the same as museum glass. What is the small brush you're using now? So this is a, a, a stiff synthetic brush. Um, it's just got some nice spring to it. And I can just kind of all work right. those paper fibers a little bit and make that so it doesn't look quite so unnatural. Okay, I think you should come back on camera, but just hold it there for a second. Is there any way you can get your camera a little closer? Sure, it might be a little shake. That's all right, we don't mind a little shake. Ooh, wow, nice, excellent. How about some thumbs up and applause for Matthew Bird? Thumbs up and applause. Matthew uh, has a website, matthewbird.com, and uh, he has watercolor workshops. And uh, so you, you make sure you visit there and, and check it out. And also Matthew is going to be part of Watercolor Live. Matthew, any final thoughts on that? Well, I'm really excited about it. Um, and the numbers you were talking about are, are amazing. So it's going to be great to have everybody there. And I'm happy to share uh, any all my my tricks on varnishing and what I've learned over the years. So it'll be a fun time. Well, we're excited about it. Nothing like this has happened in the watercolor world with this many great stars on stage together. Yeah. It's virtual. So people can watch all over the world. We've got the, the ability to put people in small groups. And so they get to know each other. And then we paint together at the end of the day uh, on the same subject, which is fun. And we have a cocktail party and, so it's a lot of fun. Uh, it's 100% refundable. So if you watch the first day and don't feel like you got the entire week's worth of uh, content, uh, if it's not been worth it, we'll refund your money because we, we just know that you're going to have a great time. Matthew, we're really happy you're going to be a part of it. Thank you for doing that. And thank you for being here.